Well, good morning. I know it's not quite there yet, but happy, happy anniversary. The last time that I was here was here with Bishop Brett, and we were gloriously starting helping you start this church. And what an amazing moment that was. Um, Pastor Sean and Danelle, thank you for the extra pounds that we put on while we were here. It's been a very short trip, but we've, we're, but we're expanded in more ways than one. And your hospitality has been absolutely over the top. Gosh, uh, love you guys, um, everybody except Brian, but um, <laughs> love, uh, uh, love, love you guys tremendously. Such a privilege to be here. Turn in your Bible to John, the fourth chapter. We'll get right into the Word today. Um, quite a bit we're going to look at. But one of the things that I've noted is that life is simply a series of expectations. Met, unmet, verbalized, not verbalized. And coming into 44 years of marriage here in just a couple of weeks... Uh, one of the things that I've learned as a husband, and I'm a, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Ladies, let me just tell you, a rolled up newspaper, smack us across the nose like a puppy, and you will eventually get it. How about it, Pastor David Houston? I mean, we'll eventually, wives, can you can train your husbands that way. Everybody wave at Pastor David, by the way. He is, David's here from Nashville, and he is one of the greatest church consultants on the planet today. And he's here he is. All right. But it is but but expectations. And it's I, I've learned in marriage that it's not just enough to wait for your wife to tell you. You have to anticipate it. Because she has expectations, Pastor Sean. And you got to get into that. And life is all about expectations. Everything that we touch, we walk into with an expectation. Do we not? I mean, you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, there's an expectation when they hand you the bag that what? There's going to be a Big Mac in the bag. Hello? You get, you get into traffic and you assume that that idiot that's beside you in traffic is going to do certain things or not do certain things. We have expectations. Everything that we touch. I've got a book that I've outlined, which probably, well, I won't say that. It's called Not So Great Expectations, because I really believe this is the real essence of life, is defining those expectations well. And in John, the fourth chapter, we find one of those sort of famous seminal stories of Scripture. You know it well. It's the woman at what? The well. And you know it. And this is a woman that came that day with very normal, if not low, expectations. She came simply to draw water for her household. She wasn't looking for anything miraculous or supernatural to happen, except she ran into this guy who began to speak to her about her life. And all of her expectations shifted in that moment. And it says in John 4, leaving her water jar, verse 20, 28, she went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And it says they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Let's pray. Lord, in our few minutes together this morning, Lord, speak to us. Lord, let us shift our expectations of another Sunday, another message. God, change us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come see a man. But what's remarkable is this woman came with very natural expectations. But this, this one word of knowledge that Jesus had about her family life, and that's a very delicate way of putting this woman's condition. All of a sudden, they were different. 
To the point that even the natural jar that she brought to that moment, it says she left it behind. Because she realized she had come for something natural, but she left with something supernatural. As a matter of fact, she came to a well, but as on the basis of her testimony, she became a well. It's that all of a sudden she came for natural things and got something far away and beyond. On the basis of what? A simple prophecy. She didn't see the dead raised. She didn't see any more money in her bank account. One word of knowledge. And it unlocked an entire community. As this woman's expectations were shifted. On the basis of where can I get this living water? And everything about this connection was wrong. The gender was wrong. A Samaritan. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? I mean, she immediately becomes antagonistic. Then she tries to get theological with God himself about worship. How many of you, it's probably not best to discuss theology with God. So she begins to talk, yes, well, our fathers worshiped on this mountain woman. Let me just tell you, everything, everything you think you know is probably wrong. Because that's not the kind of worship. The father's looking for a different type of worshiper. Jesus blew her expectations out of the water in that moment. Let me just tell you. Is that God's going to use this church exactly the same way? Let me just tell you. Is that expectations are going to shift as the water flows out of this house. And whether it is a a pushback, maybe on the gender of the pastor, whether a pushback on theological issues, a pushback, on why do you people, quote unquote, you people, why do you do what you do? Let me just tell you, as you allow that water to flow in and through your lives in this church, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, let me tell you, this city is going to be affected. And it's not, and it's not just because of your great ecclesiology, the, your great systems, your whatever it might be, is because wherever that water flows, things change. Amen. Hear me. Hear me. A simple prophecy changed everything. But she asked this question, where can I get this living water? Now, she was probably thinking, well... I would really like not to have to make this trip anymore. (laughs) But Jesus was offering her something way far away and beyond what she could even understand in that particular moment. The same way that you and I, every one of us in this room, stumbled into salvation. Because we wanted Jesus to be and do something for us in that moment. Make my pain go away. I need this. I would prefer not to go to hell. And so we all sort of stumbled in having really no idea that which Christ really was going to become to us and through us. We really didn't know. Our expectations have to continually be adjusted upwards, if you wish. Asking the wrong question, we come looking for the natural things and God is begging us, commanding us, put down your natural jar and pick up a different container. And the container is called a wineskin. A wineskin flexible enough to contain the living water that God wants to pour out. But we have to move beyond just me and mine. We have to move beyond our own narcissistic, selfish orientation as to what am I going to get out of this? And trying to figure out, God, how can you craft a wineskin in such a way that the water can come out? that we can contain that which you want to pour into us. And we're going to ask ourselves, where can I get this living water? And we're going to find ourselves at different times of our life in what I believe are one of three different places. 
Turn over to 2 Kings, and you, those of you that know me for a moment know this is the only book of the Bible I preach out of. <laughs> Pretty much because I can make it say anything I want it to say. <laughs> All kidding aside, Dr. R.T. Kendall, who I've gotten to know just a little bit, has just written and published a book entitled Double Anointing about the life of Elisha. And I don't know why, but he asked me to write the foreword to that book, which I did. And so it's a, it's a great book, lots of, just, just lots of insight into the prophet Elisha. But if we look at Elisha, his fascinating figure for me, I mean, the lone disciple of Elijah. We don't get, we, we, have, we have no inscripturated book from either Elijah or Elisha. And yet we find in Elisha, Something very, very different. We find a type. Now, we look in the Old Testament, and we many times we can see sort of prefiguring the ministry of Jesus. And we see in Elisha, even more than Elijah, we see even prefigured in his miracles of raising the dead, etc., and so forth. The miracle of multiplication. We see them prefigured in the ministry of Elisha. Very interesting. The first three miracles, recorded miracles of Elisha, all have to do, interestingly enough, with water. Now, we know Jesus' first miracle also dealt with what? Water. Turning the water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. And the first three miracles of Elisha are all dealing with issues concerning water. Now, we know Elisha asked Elijah a very difficult thing. Elijah, as he's about to be taken up, 2 Kings, second chapter, he says, what can I do for you? He says, I want a double portion of what you've got. That would be a little bit like getting financial advice from Warren Buffett and saying, how can I help you? I want twice of what you got. It's like, you have lost your mind. Now, yes, Elisha, for a dozen years or so, had faithfully followed and served Elijah. And yet, I don't know about you, but Elijah was the man. He was the guy. He was the dude. You know, 1 Kings 17, it ain't raining no more. No do, no nothing until I say. I got to tell you, that's a little something, something going on when you can command weather like that. And yet, Elisha, fully knowing all of this about Elijah, said, I want twice what you have and we know from scripture there are 14 inscripturated miracles of elijah there are 28 recorded miracles of elisha Twin number 28 done when they threw a corpse on his bones and the corpse came to life yeah. let me tell you when you can raise the dead when you are dead that's anointed <laughs> i mean that ain't that ain't half bad you know what i'm saying but we find this story in the second chapter. Elijah's about to be taken up into heaven the way we all want to go. No muss, no fuss, no, you know, no pain, you know, uh, no, no hospice, you, you know, no, no advanced directives or arrangements or any of that. He just blasts off. And Elisha knows this is about to happen. And he asks that question, what can I do for you? Elijah is taken up. Elijah had told Elisha, if you see me when I go, while you've asked a difficult thing, I'll grant the thing that you've asked. Fascinating. And that's exactly what happened. But Elijah left something behind. He left his mantle. Now that mantle, that cloak, that garment that he was wearing, it represented his anointing. It represented, if you wish, his authority he said and he looked and there it was now if if you look back at the story and i'm having to tell this quickly but when they get to the jordan it says that elijah had struck the struck the jordan with that cloak and the jordan parted and they walked across on dry ground and we have every assumption that the waters came back together once elijah and elisha had crossed over but here all of a sudden, Elijah's gone. The mantle is sitting there on the ground. And it says Elisha did what? It says he stooped down and he 
picked it up. And then what did he do? He didn't just put it on and style it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, look, I look good in this. Now, if you remember, about a dozen years earlier, he had worn that same mantle just for a moment. Because when Elijah came and found him, he was plowing. He was a businessman. He threw that mantle on him. But you see, 12 years earlier, Elisha couldn't wear it. See, some of us think we can wear mantles whenever we want. Let me just tell you, it takes time. It takes service. It takes a certain degree of suffering and, and character before all of a sudden the, the, the mantle that God has fitted out for us really becomes ours. Let me tell you, there are a lot of Christians, they're styling, but it ain't theirs. And you can't walk in somebody else's anointing. you got to walk in the one that God has uniquely ordained for your life hear me and so Elisha he picks it up and he says where now is the God of Elijah and he does the same thing he hits the Jordan it parts and he walks over see he walked over under Elijah's anointing he walked back under his own anointing but what did he have to do it says he had to stoop down and he had to pick up what had been left behind for him Jesus said about the Holy Ghost, he said, it's good for you that I'm going away. Because unless I go, the counselor will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Do you realize God left behind the Holy Spirit? Do you realize that it required the death of Jesus not just to deal with the sin issue, not to just get us right with a holy, perfect God, but to release the Holy Ghost for you and I. Not to be casual about, but just like Elisha picking up that mantle, have we picked up all of that which the Holy Spirit has left behind of Jesus that He wants from you and from me. Jesus says, it will bring glory to me that the Holy Spirit will take from me, make known to you everything that is in the Father's heart and will for your life. But let me tell you, it's not enough just to say, oh, I, oh yeah, I go to a Spirit-filled church. Oh, oh yeah, Pastor Danelle's prophesied over me. I, oh, I, yeah, I got, I got the recording right here on my phone. I mean, and... You know, yeah, you know, I talk in tongues sometimes during worship, but that's about it. You know, it's not enough. That's not enough. You've got to walk in this anointing. You've got to pick it up. You've got to humble yourself to stoop down and get it. You've got to do something with it once you get it. Why? Because every one of us are going to come to some Jordan keeping us from our inheritance. Every one of us. Joshua, waiting to take the entire nation over the Jordan at what? Flood tide. This is a bad time. But rather than this Jordan River, you know, you know, being 30 or 40 feet across, all of a sudden now it's three or 400 feet wide. But what does it say? It says that the Jordan is always at flood tide during what? Come on. Harvest. Some of us old guys in the room. I mean, we had the 60s and 70s, the Jesus movement, the charismatic redoal. We came into the 1980s where we saw the restoration of the prophetic and the apostolic. We came into the 90s where we had this kind of bizarre outpouring of, of falling and laughing and everything else. And then we blow into the new millennium with an emphasis on the evangelist and mission and evangelism. And yet the question for us today, what does it look like for us in this moment? Let me tell you, you are facing currents theologically, culturally, that Pastor David and myself and Ron and Ann, we didn't have to face during those moments. Let me tell you, the currents are much more deadly. They're moving faster. But why is that? Because it's harvest. It's harvest. 
And we look and we talk a lot about next gen and the next generation and generational transfer and all of this. But let me just tell you, is it harder for this generation? Yes. But it's not just because of the issues that are going on around our life and declining morals. and, and, and I, No, it's because we're coming to harvest. Listen to me. And whatever is separating you is because of harvest, because the Jordan is at flood tide. And the only way across is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that God wants to give you and me. Hear me. And listen, saints, there's always a Jordan separating you from your promise. I mean, we all would like, God, just let me walk on top. <laughs> well, God, there's got to be a bridge here somewhere. So you see folk, and they, they go from conference to conference and church to church, and certainly there's got to be an easier place to crawl. There's not. You've got to part that water. Wow. You've got to part the water sometimes. But then there are times that God will call us to heal the water. We find another story, another 2 Kings Joshua story. And we find that over in the same chapter, as a matter of fact. He's at Jericho, actually the second chapter. Now, Jericho is a very interesting place. Once again, one of these famous stories. You remember Jericho and the wall and the trumpets and the wall fell and all this kind of stuff. But many times we don't remember that Joshua did a little something. He says, cursed is any man that attempts to rebuild this city. And we, we come to this story in 2 Kings, and it says the men of Jericho, they came to Elisha and they said to him, look, the land is well situated, but the water is bad and produces death. It's very interesting. Now, why is that? Jericho was one of the geographically one of the richest places. It was known as the Isle of Palms. Palm trees grew there. It was a major migration and commerce route. And yet, for 500 years, this is the span of time, Jericho remained under a curse. And in this moment, the prophet Elisha comes. And he says, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And he threw salt into the water supply. And it says to this day, the water was made fresh. You see, Jericho was well situated, but it was cursed. The Lord began to speak to me at the end of last year. He said, son, that's the condition of the nation in which you live. Well situated, but under a curse thought to myself, oh my goodness, isn't that interesting? I began to look at Deuteronomy 28 about curses. And some of the manifestations of those are confusion, sickness. It says that your, uh, your, your trough, your kneading basket will be empty. Anybody heard of supply chain issues? Don't make no sense. We can talk about China and we can talk about ships and trucks and labor and all this kind of stuff. But Pastor Sean, my, my, my wife went to try to buy a Virginia ham in Virginia. in Virginia for her sister who lives in Florida for Christmas. So we go to the same place that we've been buying Virginia hams for years and they look with a straight face. They look at my wife and says, we don't have any. They're supply chain issues. I'm thinking, so you've got Virginia hams that are sitting in a cargo ship off Long Beach. Help me out, help me out here just a moment, because we got a pig farmer, we got the ham guy, and we got a store, and somewhere we've got supply chain problems trying to buy a Virginia ham. I mean, I'm sorry, but it did it don't make no sense. And you begin to look at the outworkings of a curse, it don't make no sense. COVID, mask, no mask, distance, no distance, two shots, three shots, no, wait on the fourth shot. What is the truth? All of us were just looking for some real direction. 
some clarion voice to get us through the moment, and yet it never came. Where does that confusion come from? It's the manifestations of a curse. C.S. Lewis wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It's a megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Could it be that the challenges that we have been facing, could it be God shouting at us? Dr. Kendall again, and I quote, it's my conviction that America is under judgment for at least four reasons, racism, abortion, same-sex marriage, and theological liberalism in many churches, unquote. I developed a definition of a curse for the sake of one message. <laughs> the spiritual and natural consequences of unconfessed, unresolved, or unreconciled sin. And here we are. Guess what? Just like Elisha, God is calling the church into a priestly role. Because we're the only ones that can stand in the gap and break the curse. Well situated. But the water is producing death. And there is a role that God wants us to step into. And, and I've heard preaching and teaching like you have. Well, the bowl represents prayer and the salt represents purity. And all. Let me tell you, we don't see Elisha doing this any other time in his ministry. It was simply a prophetic act that he did one time. And while these other things can be applied, I'm not sure that they are real great interpretations of what was happening in this moment. Wow. Too much water, bad water, but what about no water? And I'll close with this. Years ago, I read in National Geographic, the wars of the 20th century were fought over oil. The wars of the 21st will be fought over water. And if you look today, pretty much globally, there's a water crisis. I mean, we can look at our own country, Colorado River, Lake Mead, I mean, all of these indicators that just, we, just less water. And this is not just a phenomenon that's affecting us in the United States, but it's, it's really a global phenom that people are buying up water rights. People used to buy up real estate, but now they're buying up water rights because this is going to be the real currency of power in the next few decades. We find a story over in 2 Kings, the third chapter. We find this unlikely alliance of three kings, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. And they come together in this alliance. Moab has stopped paying taxes, and they're going to go get their stuff, and they take this strategic route through a desert. It was a shortcut. It had the, the possibility of surprise. The only problem was it was a tactical error in that they ran out of water for their soldiers and their livestock on the way through the desert. Very interesting. And we see the king of Israel says, has God brought us three kings together to die in the desert? Now, it's real interesting because we don't see any inquiry of God whatsoever. What we see is strategy, we see tactics, but what we don't see is inquiry. Listen to me, kids. The reality is many of us find ourselves in the desert, out of water, out of provision, but it's not a desert God has called us into. It's a desert of our own making. How many decisions do we make outside of counsel, outside particularly of the counsel of God, because it seems to be the right thing in the moment, and yet God is nowhere to be found. And then we find ourselves in the desert, dying of thirst, and then it's all of a sudden, ah, God, why did you lead us here? And God's like, I didn't. And let me just tell you, you need to know the difference in a desert of your making and a desert of God's making. God will lead us into the desert. Don't kid yourself. But when God leads you there, there's provision in the desert. When God doesn't, it ain't there. Some of you, that's your, your decision-making grid many times. It's strategic, but it's not spiritual. 
because you didn't stop and ask. I am chagrined at how much of my life I still do under my own authority, my own autonomy, without really stopping to ask permission. Or God, might this be your will? Fascinating. And so here they are together, these three kings. And they go and they seek out the company of the prophet. Now, this is one of the few times, if not the only time, that I can find in the Old Testament where kings went to the prophets. Most of the time, the prophets are coming to the kings. But the, the, the script is flipped here. Is that because they're jammed up, all of a sudden now, they are seeking out what? A word from God. They're seeking out spiritual counsel. Listen to me, guys. I'm telling you, the world is coming to the church because the world is out of answers. They're out of gas. They're out of water. Years ago when schools would say, no, no, you can't come. Separation, church and state. Schools are saying now, our kids, they're so messed up. They're so jacked up. They're killing one another. Come on, bring everything you got. Doors that were closed are now opening. It's happening. I'm telling you. And these unlikely alliances that they find themselves in. Three, three kings. I mean, the house of Ahab. Come on. Jehoshaphat, the only righteous king of the three. And the king of Edom. I mean, nothing good came out of Edom. I mean, we find that, 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 that the Edomites became a clan known as the, 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 the Edomians. And we look a little bit further down the road in history. You know who? was one of the most famous Edomians in Scripture, Herod the Great. He was an Edomite. And the persecution continued even all the way into Jesus' lineage. Fascinating. And they come to the prophet. And the prophet says, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't give you fools a time of day. Bring me a minstrel. Worship begins to happen. And Elisha begins to prophesy. And he says, make this valley full of ditches. For you will see neither wind nor rain. Yet, tomorrow, at the time of the morning sacrifice, this valley will be full of water. Oh, and by the way, you're going to overthrow your enemies. Almost as an aside. Now, this is a very interesting command right here. Having studied this for a moment, they were not digging new ditches. They were actually clearing out old ones. They were called wadis. They were these depressions, if you wish, where water once flowed through them. But because of neglect and a lack of water, things had grown up in them. Ladies and gentlemen, what's grown up? What have you allowed to crowd the channel of God through your life? Time, disillusionment, disappointment. What have you allowed to stop the flow of God from coming in your life? Let me tell you, it's time to clear out the waters because the water is getting ready to flow. That is a promise. And he says, you'll see neither wind nor rain, yet there'll be water. Wait a minute. I'm a charismatic. I love manifestations. What do you mean, no wind, no rain? Both of those are types, pictures, if you wish, of the Holy Spirit. Maybe nobody's going to put their hands on you. Maybe there's no overt spiritual gift. Maybe there's no altar moment. And yet God says, don't look for the external. We've got such weirdness in the body of Christ right now from, you know, molting angels and jewels and all this kind of weirdness and gold teeth. Ooh, Pastor Jim, you didn't say that. Yeah, I did. You'll see neither wind nor rain yet. The water's going to move. Some of you are still like Holy Ghost weathermen. Just looking. Certainly this is the only way that God can do a thing. Let me tell you, God can do it however he wants to do it. And guess what happened? The next morning, there was water. There was water. Some of you have found yourselves once again in very, very dry places. And you wonder, God, where's water? 
God says, dig. Dig. We all want the move of God, but the question is, is, is there enough expectation that there's preparation that comes with it? It's one thing to say, oh, I got faith. Great. What are you doing about it? Where is the natural preparation that you're making? We talk about harvest. If you believe this harvest, are you crafting your life? Are we crafting our churches to be wineskins that can receive a harvest? Are there nets being prepared? Or are we just wanting just to come together as in our us four no more and, oh, I just love the teaching and the fellowship and the worship and this, that. That's not what God's called us to be. Not at all. Wow. I'll close with this. One more water story. We see Elisha breaking a 500-year curse at Jericho. But there was another curse from the prophet Elijah. Remember when he cut off hydration? It was a curse that he placed on the land. And we find after the throwdown at Mount Carmel, he sends Ahab on his way. He says, you need to go on ahead because there's no way in the world you're going to be able to navigate what's about to happen. He says, I hear the sound of what? Heavy rain. Saints, listen to me and hear this well. I hear the sound of heavy rain. Prophetic men and women that I admire are saying exactly the same thing. And yeah, we, we read the same news you read. Russia, China, Ukraine, NATO, COVID, recession. We're reading all the same news you're reading. We're looking. And yet we're hearing something different. We're hearing the sound of heavy rain. And I want to say this to you as clearly as I know how this morning. I believe that we are on the precipice of one of the great outpourings of God in generations. Hear me. In the midst of and in spite of. All the conditions are wrong. But if you look back at all of the, that, that prefaced the last two great awakenings, it was, all, it was right. Social upheaval. Things were falling apart. What makes this one different is not localized. It's global. God's about to do something here, saints. Hear me. And whether it's Myrtle Beach or Washington, D.C. or Nashville, Tennessee, it doesn't matter. God is doing this globally. He spoke to me at the beginning of uh, in 2020, I'll never forget it, it was recorded in a, in a leader's meeting. This was before COVID shut everything down. And I prophesied, God is going to drag a plow through the nations as a result of this virus. But it's going to be a plow for harvest. He spoke to me when the thing in the Ukraine broke loose. He said, it's a second plow. Those of us that come from farming families understand that there's a plow that digs deep. It turns over things from the past. But then there's a second plow that prepares for the sowing of seed. And I believe that we're seeing multiple plows dragged through the nations right now. Because God is about to send rain. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, thank you that the amazing privilege of being alive in this moment. Historical. You could have chosen any other generation, but you've chosen this moment, this people. God, let us be the wineskins that can receive. Let us, God, carefully craft the nets that we might receive the harvest. As that Ezekiel 47 river of your presence flowed, it says there were fishermen on the banks of that river catching all kinds of fish. Lord, let us see beyond the natural. Let us see beyond what Fox or CNN or whoever is telling us about how the world is falling to pieces. God, let us see something by the Spirit. Let us hear what Elijah heard when he 
when he knelt down to pray, let us hear the sound of heavy rain. And God, for this church in this moment, let them see how important they are in this city, in this moment. God, you've never measured significance on the basis of numbers. This is a significant church in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Significant. And God, I pray that they would not despise the day of small beginnings. But that God, that what you're going to do will always belie their size. It will always belie their size. Lord, let us participate in this great harvest. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Jim, I, I, I got it. I'm facing this Jordan in my life. I have no idea how to get across. God says, pick up the mantle that you have and strike the water and it will part. My, Pastor Jim, the, I just feel like that there's water that's flowing through the generations of my family and it's bad water. It's not producing life. Let me just tell you, God's coming to heal that water break that curse and heal that water flowing through the generations of your family some of you say pastor jim i can't i, I can't even buy a cup i'm so dry god says stop looking to the normative of the last places but if you'll be obedient and if you'll dig if you'll deal with the disillusionment and disappointments of your past water will flow again through your life God, let it be for this church and for these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church.